Okay. Cool. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Cool. <laughs> Lukewarm enthusiasm, but I'll take it. Um, yeah, my name's Josh. Uh, as mentioned, I flew here from Montreal. It took about six hours or so. I'm curious, how many people here flew to get to this conference? Quite a few. Do me a favor, leave your hand up if you enjoyed your flight. <laughs> far, far fewer. And this to me is kind of a shame because flying is remarkable. When I, I flew back to Montreal from New York a while ago, and it just so happened that my plane was over the clouds during a sunset. And so I got to watch the sun lower over like this cloudy, magical landscape. You never see that. But it doesn't always feel so amazing. There's so many layers of obstruction that make flying feel kind of miserable. And there's a bunch of areas we could look at. Yes, I'm talking about flying for a bit, why not? Um, one of the areas that gets the most kind of contention and the most discussion online is boarding. So there's like whole articles about all the ways you can board a plane. There's a blog that's dedicated to this subject, even Mythbusters. They did a segment where they built a fake plane, got hundreds of volunteers, dressed up as pilots, and decided to test different boarding strategies. Like, look at how cute he looks in his little thing. Um, and what they found is that there is indeed a better way to board a plane. We're doing it wrong. So there's all this, like, energy put into improving this part of the flying process. And it is important, right? Because the boarding process sets the tone for the rest of the flight. And more than that, the sooner you can get people on the plane, the less time people have to spend on the plane. That's always good. But is it really the most important or the most like irritating thing about air travel? So I flew recently, as many of us did. And like I'm a curmudgeon, so I have all kinds of complaints. I'll limit it to one. The, they put the screens in the back of the seat. And then they put games on these screens. So you're sitting there and like the person behind you is like playing whatever the hell it is. And like your whole chair is rattling. Okay, why am I talking about this? Well, I think that it makes an interesting comparison to how we think about performance. So when we talk about performance, uh, like in the React community and in JavaScript even more broadly, like these are some of the things that we talk about. We talk about doing server-side rendering, which is the process of making our page paint more quickly by pre-generating the HTML on the server. And then we realize that it's no good if it paints quickly if it's not interactive, so we have to like make our bundle smaller by reducing the bundle sizes and code splitting. Even like the whole idea of a single page app is just that when I click on a link, I want the next page to load quicker. We don't often think about everything else, right? Like everything that happens after those first couple of seconds. And this, to me, is kind of a shame because we spend a lot more time using products than we do waiting for them to load. Very scientific pie chart. Um, so this talk is called Saving the Web, 16 milliseconds at a time. And it's a talk about how animation performance matters, essentially. The title is a little hyperbolic, but not as much as you might think. So let's talk about why this is important. And I think there's a bunch of angles we could look at this through, but the framing I'd like to choose is comparing mobile mobile native apps to web apps. So when it comes to the experience of, let's say I want to try a new app for the first time. If it's a mobile app, I have to change apps to the app store, search for the app, check the reviews, download the app, which as we'll see is like ridiculously enormous, wait for it to install, deal with permissions. There's all this like initial friction, right? I'm actually curious if anyone wants to shout out a guess as to how big the native Facebook mobile app is. Wow, people are actually really close. 461 megabytes. For comparison, Mario 64 was 32 megabytes. There's like 15 Mario 64s in Facebook app. Mario 64 was a big game. So, and like just by comparison, if I wanna use a web app for the first time, I type in the URL, I wait three seconds and it's done. So given those two sets of experiences, why is it that mobile apps even exist? Why is it that Web apps haven't just made mobile apps completely obsolete. And I think there's a bunch of answers, but one reason is user experience. Once you get through that initial hurdle, it's a sad fact that mobile apps tend to feel better. I was listening to a podcast, the React podcast, um, and the guest they had on that week was Matt Perry. And Matt Perry is the author of a few different animation libraries like Pop Motion and Pose. And he had a really good point about why he thinks animation matters. And his point was that it's all about relevance. So, like many people, I no longer have a cable subscription because Netflix is better, it's on demand, there's no commercials. 
I wonder what happens to the web if we continue to lag behind mobile in terms of experience. Is it possible, and I think the answer to this is yes, because we see it in some places of the world, but is it possible that mobile apps will make web apps totally redundant, where people will just have a set of mobile apps on their phone, they never even use the internet browser? And I think this would be a shame, not only because most of us work on the web, um, but also because it's an amazing open platform. There's a bunch of examples, but I'll just highlight a couple. Code Sandbox, which on its own is an amazing online IDE, recently launched the fact that you can deploy to Netlify in one click, which means that I can go to the electronics store, buy a Chromebook, and immediately start writing a web app that I can like, build on the computer, on the web, for the web, and I can deploy it instantly, deploy to a globally available CDN for free immediately, which is like amazing. And like, there's other examples of like, so this is Webflow, which is a tool that exists to help people build websites that aren't technical. So it's like this incredibly low friction accessible medium, and it's available to anyone that has a computer. So the web is low friction, both for consumers and developers, and I think the web is really content rich because of it. There's so many examples of amazing things on the web. And I think if we wanna make sure that the web stays relevant, we have to compete with native apps on a quality experience. Okay. So let's look at some animations and see what we can do about all this. So I'm gonna pick on Bootstrap a little bit. Um, it's not really Bootstrap that I'm picking on, it's a common accordion issue, but Bootstrap is the most commonly used one. So an accordion, for those who don't know, is this kind of a UI, where I click on an item and it collapses the other ones and expands. So I'm gonna open the dev tools, and wow, these are big dev tools. And I'm gonna go over to my performance tab this computer is an expensive computer, so I'm gonna throttle this. I'm gonna click record. I'm gonna to toggle these things a little bit. Okay, and then we'll see what we get. So, by the way, the title of this talk is Saving the Web 16 Milliseconds at a Time. And the reason for that title is that if we wanna have smooth animations, we need to run at about 60 frames a second, or that's actually kind of the high end, that's our ideal. If we can hit 60 frames a second, not only is that the refresh rate for many monitors, but it's a speed at which our eyes just see things as fluid motion. And when you do the math, what that means is that you only have about 16 and a half milliseconds to do all the work that you need for every frame. So if we zoom in here, we'll see that, actually it did better than I thought, it did better in my last tests. Um, but there's definitely some like moments of issues, like over here, we're like hovering around 39, 31. And so if we dig into why this is happening, I don't know what these gray task things are, but looking below that, we see that we're spending the bulk of our time in this layout step, this update layer tree step, and then this paint step. That's like like the paint step alone is all of our budget. So what do these mean and how do we improve upon it? So to talk about this, we need to know a little bit about the pixel pipeline, which is a really cool term. I gave it a really cool graphic. Um, really what it refers to is just the process by which pixels on the screen can be updated. Not all of these steps have to be present, but these are the steps that can be present. So sometimes there's a JavaScript trigger. Then we have some style, which is the process of figuring out which CSS rules apply to which DOM nodes. Layout is figuring out like where things on the page move if something resizes or changes position. Paint is the process of doing rasterization, so like figuring out which pixel every, which color every pixel on the screen has to be and actually painting it. And then finally compositing is the process of taking already painted layers and like transforming them in some way. So the two most expensive ones are those two middle ones, layout and paint. And what's interesting is that different CSS properties trigger different steps in this pipeline. For example, background color will never trigger layout because there's no value I can set for background color that changes the size or position of something. There's a cool website called cssstriggers.com and it shows you kind of all the different CSS properties and which steps in the pixel pipeline they can trigger. It's not really, unfortunately, so straightforward because certain properties trigger certain steps in certain conditions, but it's a really good way to quickly check and see, get a rough approximation for how expensive a property is to change. The golden rule, and what you hear, is that if you want to avoid both layout and paint, you only have two choices when it comes to animation. You can either change the opacity, which is how visible something is, how transparent, or you can tweak the transform, which is like kind of a grab bag of all kinds of different things. It gives you translate, which you can use to move things around. It gives you rotate, scale, so how do we use all this information to build a better accordion? Well, I mean, it's kind of sad, but we can't really. Because the thing is, in this accordion, when I expand this, all the stuff below here has to change its layout, and it has to do it on every frame. If I look over here, the amount that it's painting is 6,200 pixels in height. It's painting the whole thing. And we can maybe improve on that somewhat, but it would be really tricky to do all of that using transforms and scales. 
So instead, I have kind of an alternative proposal. So here I have this uh, thing that shows all the information Wikipedia has about boarding, which is surprising. Um, and you'll see that I'm doing a few things. One is that I have this little cute little swivel animation on the carrot. That's not really what we're here to talk about, but I think it's cute. Um, it updates the height of the layout immediately. So you pay that cost of layout and paint on the first frame, but then all of the contents of this accordion are able to animate smoothly. And they do that by putting a transform translate on this. It shifts down slightly by a few pixels as it fades in. And so because of that, your brain still gets that sense of vertical motion with it expanding, but this is an accordion that will run great on all devices. Okay. So we're look, I'm going to look at some code, but really the point of this talk isn't to look at any specific implementation. I really want this talk to be more of a high-level ideas kind of talk. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. All the code will be made available at the end for anyone who's curious about this specifically, but let's look at it. So I have an accordion item component. I'm using some context to grab which accordion item is currently open because this would be one of many in a set, and then I also have the method to update that. I have this little handle toggle function, which when I click on something will either close the current one or open the current one, depending on if I'm clicking on the one that's already open. Um, here I have a button. This is the one that actually handles that click. And then I'm kind of just rendering a title in it, but I'm also putting that little icon before. And here we see our first little uh, like CSS transition. So I'm using a transform rotate, and then based on whether it's open or not, I rotate it either 90 degrees or zero. It points to the right by default. So if it's open, I need to like rotate it down. Um, and then I also have my body animation. And there's a couple ways we could handle this. This is kind of the standard React way, which is just if it's open, I render this stuff. If it's not, I close it. And in my experience, even with the, like, so in my demo, I had quite a bit of content in here. I also have cats because I like cats. These ones are called Scottish folds. Their ears are folded. Um, okay, I'll get back to my talk. Um, so, like, this is kind of how you typically do this stuff. Um, but it does mean that you incur the cost of remounting this. So not only are you just changing a CSS property, but all the DOM within here has to be remounted. It is kind of the cleanest way to do it because the alternative is to do something like this. So here I have a div that I'm changing the opacity and the transform, but then opacity doesn't actually, when you fade something out, it still takes up all of its space. So you also have to kind of put an internal thing that triggers its display from block to none. So it's like a bit more complicated, but in certain cases it could be more performant. I think that we often follow dogmas a little bit too closely because the rules of only animating transform and opacity are there for a reason, but that doesn't mean that they are absolute. So at Khan Academy a little bit ago, we added this little navigation item and we wanted an accordion. And you'll notice that I'm doing the same bootstrap thing. So all this stuff below is being shifted around, which means we're paying that cost of layout and paint on every frame. But in this case, it's okay because of two reasons. The first is that I know that I'm never gonna have mountains of text in all of these. It's a menu, so there's relatively little that needs to be repainted on every frame. Um, the cost of painting is related to how much has to be painted. The other thing is that this, as it says at the top, is a teacher tools thing. And so it was a product used internally by teachers, and teachers overwhelmingly use desktop devices. We have very, very little mobile use. So it's the kind of thing where if you know the context that what you're building it for, you can have a little bit more flexibility, whereas if we knew that this needed to run on five-year-old Android devices, we probably wouldn't have been able to do this. Okay, let's look at another animation. Let's look at a like button. So I built this a little bit ago. Actually, we built it in a workshop yesterday. And it's uh, my take on a little, this is, it looks like Twitter, but it's not, I'm not really a cat. Um, when I click on this, it's, I've created my own little version of the animation. So there's the springy heart, a little popping circle that's subtle, and the particles, which is what I want to talk about. Here it is again, kind of bigger, so that we can actually see what it's doing. So I've built a lot of particles over the years, and the API that I've discovered is best looks something like this. I have a particle component which specifies an angle and a distance. You can think of angle as the direction this particle is going to fly off into. Zero degrees tends to be directly to the right. I'm gonna mirror this so it's complicated. Um, negative 45 degrees, it goes clockwise, so 45 degrees would go down, whereas negative 45 degrees would go up. Um, and then distance is kind of the magnitude. So you can think of this actually as a vector. You have a direction and a magnitude. Interestingly, I like it when the particle doesn't actually specify the, the UI that it's rendering. So I, it's not always gonna look the same. Instead, I just pass it a child. And the child can be anything. Here it's a red circle. Could be anything, could be a GIF, why not? So to implement something like this, we get into a little bit of trouble. And to talk about why, let's go visit JS Paint because that exists now in the browser, because the web is an amazing platform that allows stuff like this to be possible. Um, so let's say I have a little heart. This is my like button. 
I also recognize that it's quite early in the morning to be doing math. I apologize, but I promise this will be fun. So I have some particle, and let's assume that I've positioned that particle to start right in the center. So I know then, let's say that my angle is negative 45 degrees, so it's gonna go off kind of just like this, some amount in that direction. Um, and then let's also say that I have a distance of 100 pixels. I want this pixel, or this particle, to shoot off in that direction at that magnitude. Where is my cursor? There it is. So let's assume that's there. The tricky thing now is that I want to use a transform translate animation on this. But transform translate doesn't take angle and magnitude. It takes x and y. So I need to figure out what this translates to <laughs> in terms of x and y. So let me go ahead and draw an axis that represents our zero degree line. So now we can pretend, or not pretend, but we can recognize that this angle is 45 degrees, 45. In my practice, I did this with an actual mouse, and I'm discovering that a trackpad is not as easy. Okay, so I know this angle is 45 degrees. I also know that this distance is 100. So we need to use something that, at least in Canadian high schools, they gave us this cute little mnemonic called so ka toa, which always like reminds me of the Skyrim battle chants or whatever those were. <laughs> so what this gives us, what this means, is that it tells us that the sine of an angle is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse, while the cos of an angle is equal to the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. This generally works with triangles, so let's give ourselves a triangle, a right angle triangle specifically. So here's our little right angle. So, right, I also forgot to mention, or forgot to write at least, that we know that this distance is 100. So this is gonna be our hypotenuse because it's the one opposite the right angle, it's the longest side. And really what I wanna know is this side because this is y, and I wanna know this side because this is x. So the sine of an angle is equal to the opposite side, y, over the hypotenuse. And so y is the only unknown. So if I was to say sine of, goodness, I don't want you. Um, sine of 45 is equal, this is just gonna be too much work. It's equal to the opposite side y over 100, so which means that if you multiply both sides by 100, you can calculate for y. So trigonometry complete. We can look at how we actually use that in JavaScript. So here I have my component that takes the angle and distance as well as the children. Um, one like funky detail is that all the JavaScript trigonometry functions expect the angle to be in radians, but that's a simple matter of conversion. So my y is equal to the math.sine of that angle times the distance, where the x is equal to math.cos of that angle times the distance, and now that we have a y and an x, we can actually translate it. I've decided to use React Spring for this because I really like the springy physics, and uh, I was gonna talk about this a little bit, but the next talk is by one of the maintainers of React Spring, so that'll be even better. Um, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm saying I want it to go to this x and y position starting from zero, zero, and I want this to happen on mount so that I, have, I can use this from. The way that the React Spring API works is that you can pass this style, or this spring rather, onto any element you want as long as you use one of the animated ones. So it's like these wrappers around HTML primitives. Um, and just like that, I get this like cute little particle effect. Um, but I fear I've been way late a little bit because I'm talking about trigonometry in a performance talk. So let's talk about the performance of it. So it's not bad. Like here you'll see I'm throttling and I'm managing to fit in that 16 millisecond you know, it's technically meeting it, but this is happening in isolation. In a real app, other things are happening, and because I'm using React Spring, these animations happen in JavaScript on the main thread. There's this really cool thing that uh, Vincent Reamer built, and it shows that you have a bunch of animations, and they're all running pretty well, uh, but they're all running in isolation. So this code allows you to force some JS stalls. So just, it's just gonna occupy the main thread. You can imagine, like, you make a data request with GraphQL, and then it comes in, you have to parse it. And when I do that, you'll see that those two on the right, they're not doing so well. Um, and the reason for that is just that the browser can't do both. We only have one main thread, whereas the, one on, the ones on the left that use either CSS or the Web Animations API, they run in a separate process. So what are my choices? What do I do about this? Well, I could use less particles, but where's the fun in that? Um, I could use CSS transitions, but there's no Spring API for CSS. Or the one that is often not talked about is sprites. So the idea with sprites, they come from video games. And, oh goodness, that's hard to see. But rather than have uh, all of this happen dynamically, you have a single image that holds the frames. So like the first few here are the purple, I wonder if I can make this bigger, a little bit. 
Um, essentially, it's the entire animation frame by frame. And so to use this, and so what you do is you just play it like a flip book. You have one frame after the other, and it provides a pretty nice effect. And the thing is, it's like ridiculously affordable to do this. When I profile it, it it's hard because like, especially in this, it gives you a bunch of other noise from the presentation thing. But it seems, from what I can tell, to be like on the order of 30 microseconds a frame, which is like not breaking anyone's budget. Um, in terms of how you use this, because this is the interesting part, you have, uh, essentially here I'm using style components, but I have a wrapper around an image. I have a keyframe animation. So here you'll see that I'm going to translate of a negative value, which is equal to the width of the image. After I made this slide, I realized I could have just made it negative 100%, so you can pretend that's what it says. Um, here I just have a container that is sized after a single frame hiding the overflow, and then my image just runs a keyframe animation. And so most of this probably looks somewhat familiar. I have the animation itself. Again, Style Components has this API, but you can imagine if this was in CSS, I would just use the name of the animation. I have a uh, duration. I have it happening infinitely so that it happens over and over again, because who doesn't like many, many particles? Um, and then this is the interesting bit. I have steps, 34. So this is a timing function, like ease or linear, but what it does is it jumps hard cut. So it, rather than smoothly interpolating from one value, it chops it up into 34 discrete values, which in this case is exactly what we want, because I want to be able to have, essentially like, go from the first frame to the second to the third, and there's 34 frames. So just like that, we have this amazingly performant thing, right, I already talked about how quick it is. In terms of actually building this, what I did is I just got some screen capture software, recorded my screen, there's this really cool thing called Easy GIF, which just lets you drop in an animated GIF and it produces a sprite sheet. And then if you want to, optionally, you can use something like Photoshop to erase the background if you want to have this go in front, because you know, you're going to get the white background if you just record the screen. Okay, last thing I want to talk about. Um, so, off screen canvas. I built a thing a while ago, which was uh, kindly mentioned by Brett in the, in in the intro. Essentially, it's a tool to create uh, art. So I have this machine on the right, and when I tweak it, it does stuff on the left in that art display. I had a lot of fun building all these animations, and if anyone wants to play with this, it's available at tinkersynth.com. Um, but I ran into a problem while I was building this, and the problem was that this uh, stuff on the left runs in a canvas, and because of that, it runs on the main thread, and it takes a while to do this because, let me turn this machine off and on again, um, and let me go back to a more neutral color palette. Yeah, that's good enough. Um, every line, every row is a series of straight lines, and to deal with the occlusion, the fact that lines go behind others, what I do is I just look for every line segment and compare it to every other line segment in range and look for intersections. So it's like a really like labor-intensive process, and there's reasons I did it that way. I know I could have just used a mask, but I couldn't for technical things. Um, but because of that, it was taking like 30, 40 milliseconds a frame in a good case, and what that meant is that like my sliders and my other animations over here were super stuttery and laggy. And it was like actually breaking the experience. So I made a first discovery, I think someone on Twitter told me, which is that I can use a web worker for this. Web workers, right? They've existed for years, they're amazing. I never think to use them. So what that does is all the calculation of figuring out how to plot the data can be done in a separate thread that doesn't interfere with my slider. The trouble, though, is that workers don't have access to the DOM. So while I was able to calculate all that data, I still had to pay the cost of painting it, and that turned out to be about half the cost. Enter off-screen canvas. So off-screen canvas is an API that allows you to paint to a canvas from within a web worker. It allows you to use the, I, I find the off-screen canvas name very misleading because I figured it was for a canvas that was off the screen. Um, but no, it just allows you to paint to the canvas from a web worker. And what that means is that I managed to have that animation. Like I can do whatever I want in CSS land or even in JavaScript land because most of those machine animations used uh, React Spring um, without both of those things competing for resources. Browser support is so-so, so it is a much better experience on Chrome than on Safari, but hopefully that'll catch up. Just to show you, this is what it looked like before. So you'll notice the slider on the side there, how it's like not keeping up with my mouse at all, like especially there. Like it's really just not a good experience. Okay, in conclusion, I think that there's both there's two angles to performance, and they're both really important. I don't want to say that you know, the load performance that most of us think about isn't important, because it is. If people wait too long, they're going to bounce, and then you're never going to get that person. But I feel like we've put a lot of energy into fixing that problem with SSR and code splitting. What if we put the same amount of energy into like, making animations really performant? What could we achieve if we did that? And I think we can help preserve the web's relevant by building products that are really good and feel really polished. I think the smooth animations and interactions really show that the thing that you're building is high quality, which is why places like Facebook and Twitter put effort into this stuff. 
All right, thanks so much. Uh, code's available there.